Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's go back before talking about Ricardo's theory of trade, let us go back to Smith. It all begins with him and the strongest case against mercantilism is Smith's case for free trade. Do you recall what Smith's idea was on trade? All right. Smith was very aware that as long as there is unrestricted free trade across countries, efficiency levels in both countries or all the countries involved in trade would grow because the force of division of labor and specialization and growth and expansion would occur everywhere. So, free trade was universally good. The idea which Smith used in advocating free trade was that there was an advantage every country had in the sense that its labor could work better in certain trades than in other trades. So, each country could specialize increasingly in those areas where its labor would be more productive. And eventually, every country would be involved, the labor of every country would be involved in the most productive possible way and therefore, it was good for everybody. This idea was known as the idea of absolute advantage in trade theories. Have you studied uh, theory of trade sometime in your courses? What did you do? You have some idea? Can you recall? Uh, comparative advantage we studied. You studied? Very nice. So, are you aware that there was a theory of absolute advantage which preceded it? We have, hmm? we have heard of that theory, right. but we do not. So, what is comparative advantage? Two countries or two people, if they trade between each other, mm. they are producing, producing and trading what they are doing. Then, uh, even if one country has absolute advantage over both the products, they can still maximize their uh, benefit or utility. Uh, so basically, if, uh, if two countries, uh, ha, uh, if each country has uh, an um, advantage in a particular product, has higher product, can achieve higher productivity than the other country in a particular product. So that advantage over the other country is called the competitive advantage. Competitive or comparative? Uh, sorry, comparative advantage. And uh, so hence, um, if if both countries uh, produced their uh, comparative advantage in trade, then both are better off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but before this comparative advantage theory came, which was Ricardo's, came Smith's idea of absolute advantage. And uh, Prasoon was telling me something just now about even if you had absolute advantage, you would still have comparative. Tell me about it. Uh, uh, if, if, if there are two countries A and B and if A has absolute advantage and if there are, there are two goods in the uh, eco economy mm. and if A has advantage over producing these two goods, A has a better productivity, higher productivity for these two goods, if it, uh, then A can like A, A will still want to trade uh, that good which has, I mean if, I am confused. I think we can give a numerical example. Okay. But, uh, would, would somebody like to come and write on the blackboard? So, I can explain. Okay. Uh, a, if, a, if a country has a absolute advantage over two goods, A and B, hmm. but. That is absolute advantage. Yeah. But if, if, if even if it has absolute advantage over two goods A and B, 
but it has a higher productivity for good A than good B, then it would be better for him, uh, for it to trade uh, good A for good B from the other country. But that's absolute advantage. Yeah, but I even when it has higher productivity for both goods with respect to the other country, mm. still it will be better for that country to uh, trade in that good which it which right. Okay. Which it has its comparative advantage. No, no, no. He's uh, he's explaining absolute advantage. To me. Are you? No, 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 no. I am just saying that even if you have absolute advantage over two goods, in two goods. What is absolute advantage? Yeah, I mean, you can produce with the given resource, you can produce more than the other uh, other country. Well, let's put it like this: there are two goods, cloth and wine. Country A and B. Country A workers produce cloth more efficiently, country B workers produce wine more efficiently. So, you can say one has absolute advantage in cloth, another has absolute advantage in wine. So, one would trade wine for cloth, another would trade cloth for wine. I am not talking of comparative advantage, I am saying this is absolute advantage. No. So, when a country's workers are better at both, for instance, if country A's workers are both more productive with respect to both cloth and wine, then country has A has to absolute advantage in both industries and so there will be no trade. No, I am saying according to the principle of absolute advantage, right. So, the principle of ad absolute advantage rules out trade if workers are more productive in both industries in one country than in the other country. There is a little bit of a myopia here, which is what Ricardo spotted. The myopia is not with respect to the understanding that workers might be more efficient in both products in one country. They might be in both wine and cloth a country might be having higher labor productivity than the other country absolutely that is no problem. But what is important is the productivity differences of the labor in the two industries give you two domestic rates of exchange between the two, two products. Suppose, suppose a bolt of cloth or a bale of cloth takes 5 days to produce. So, 5 man days will produce 1 bale of cloth. Suppose a barrel of wine in the same country takes 8 man days of work, right. So, 8 man days is costlier than 5 man days, right. So, how would you determine the rate of exchange between wine and cloth in this country? One, one barrel of wine equals how much of cloth? I will repeat. Laborers take 5 man days to make a unit of cloth and 8 man days to make 1 unit of wine. So, what is the rate of exchange between cloth and wine as determined by the labor effort which is the only cost. Right. So, 5 by 8 is how much? About 60 percent or 0 0.6 units. Okay. So, 0.6 units of cloth equals 1 unit of wine that is the rate of exchange. Now, irrespective of how much productive the workers in the other country are, if their domestic rate of exchange is such that you can get wine for less cloth. For instance, if in the other country you can get 1 unit of wine for 0.5 units of cloth, that cloth is cheaper there. Yes, you will buy cloths from there. So, here 
whether you will buy cloth from the other country or not is not determined by whether in absolute terms their laborers are more productive in cloth than you or more productive in wine than you. No, the understanding is that domestically speaking the different rates of productivity of labor in two industries will give you a domestic rate of exchange between the two products. right? And if you can get a product from abroad at a price which is lower than its domestic price, you will import it. Or conversely, if you can get a price for a product higher than what you get domestically in exchange, then you export it. So, this is comparative advantage. So, what is the distinction between absolute and comparative advantage? Will somebody tell me now? Ashwati, I have just said it, I wish you, I am just asking if you can paraphrase me or summarize me or whatever. So, who can do it? Krishna? Okay, take some time. So, soon. Exchange between two countries when a country has advantage over both the goods. And when competitive advantage takes into account, the compares the two goods, the compare, compares the goods that countries are producing. Uh, and it, yeah. and it, uh, allows the country to produce more of the goods in which it has uh, better productivity, in which it has higher productivity and to trade off that good with the mm, Now wait, it is much simpler than that. The advantage, when you are talking of absolute advantage, has nothing to do with domestic prices of the two goods. The advantage when you talk of comparative advantage has everything to do with the domestic prices, that is all. That is what I wanted you to tell me. Ricardo's proposition is a more common sense proposition. The implication of Ricardo's comparative advantage is simply this that you can say, well, this is cheaper, I will buy it cheaper. If it is abroad, cheaper abroad, I will buy it from there. It is cheaper than in my country, as simple as that. So, it is basically, you know, the domestic price compared to international or the foreign price that makes a difference. And as trade opens up, as trade opens up, as a country with a cheaper domestic price of a product starts exporting it to the other country, its domestic price starts rising. And in the other country, as it starts importing the cheaper product, its domestic st price starts falling. Eventually, trade goes on as long as each country finds there is some advantage in exporting or importing. Eventually, the whole thing stops when the two domestic prices are both equal at the international price. Is not it? So, that is when trade stops and that is the limit to trade. The difference here is in Ricardo, it is not just some nominal price that is talked about. But the productivity of labor that is being talked about as a measure of price, no? 
So, what do we mean when we say price increases, price falls, if we are talking about price in terms of productivity of labor? Do you understand my question? So, how do you do that? Shall I repeat my question? My question is when you are talking of nominal price of something, you say it is cheaper there, I am buying it from there. So, as long as you go on buying it from there, as he keeps selling it to you, his price keeps on going up. And as you keep buying from him, your price keeps on coming down till one, at one point the two prices are the same. So, you say this is 5 rupees, uh, it used to be 10 rupees, now it has come down to 5 rupees, I am better off. Now, this is as long as nominal prices are under consideration. Suppose instead of nominal prices, you have prices in terms of labor effort, then how will the two prices equal? because there is no money nominal price involved. Nice, I think you are on the right track. What is it called the amount of production that can be achieved by an additional unit of labor? Marginal Absolutely, marginal product is not it. <coughs> so, what you are saying is some kind of equivalence of marginal products might happen. How? Let us see one industry, one country where uh, domestic price of cotton is lower than the domestic price of cotton in the other country. In other words, the exchange value as determined by productivity ratios, you find that cotton is costlier in one country, cotton, cotton is cheaper in another country. So, the country with cheaper cotton starts exporting and the country with cheap costlier cotton starts importing. No? So, what happens here? What happens is in the country where cost and cotton is being imported, the domestic cotton industry slowly starts giving up workers to the other industry. Right? So, as it starts giving up laborers to other industry, then gradually the rate domestic rate of exchange between the two industries will change, is not it. So, laborers are moving in this country from a less productive trade to a more productive trade because of trade. So, gradually what is happening is the domestic rate of exchange in the two countries will become the same. It might, it might not be nominal price, it is just the rate of exchange relative prices as measured by labor productivities. Is that sensible Krishna? So, whether you look at it in terms of nominal price or in terms of productivity induced relative prices, the effect of trade is the equivalence of domestic prices with international prices, that is it. Whereas, such a thing might not happen in the case of Smith, because domestic prices do not feature. There are no relative prices featuring there. But Ricardo's theory uh, works under restrictive assumptions. One of the assumptions of Ricardian theory is that labor is homogeneous in both countries. In the sense that, no labor is not homogeneous, sorry labor is not homogeneous that is the Heckscher-Rollin theorem labor cannot migrate from one country to another. Mobility of labor is prohibited by assumption and the states of technology in the two country remain constant. So, that the given 
differences in labor productivity continue to stay. Because if technology changes halfway through trade negotiations, the whole thing might turn topsy turvy. The third assumption, of course, is that labor is the one factor of production. Capital is not taken into consideration as a serious factor of production in the Ricardian model. So, we have three very solid assumptions on which this is based. One is productivity differences in the two countries as determined by technology remain constant and unchanging, which is the same as saying technology is unchanging. And the second assumption is that just because somebody's textile worker is very efficient, I cannot just import that worker into my country, labor is not mobile. And the third assumption of course, is that there is no intervention by the state, no, there are no taxes, there are no subsidies which distort the rates of exchange between the two countries. There are no transportation costs, because you might have comparative advantage in terms of domestic rates of exchange given by domestic productivity, but you have high transport costs across the space, your export prices will be much higher than or import prices for that matter higher than domestic exchange rates and so it might not be feasible. The other assumption is while all negotiations are going on the state of demand remains constant. Suppose you have decided that textiles from Ceylon are much cheaper than textiles from India you decided to import textiles from Ceylon. As you have taken this decision suddenly everybody in India starts losing interest in clothes. Everybody becomes a lover of what is that orange marmalade, they do not want clothes anymore. So, uh, the key assumption is that the demand, state of demand remains constant in the two countries while trade is going on. Now, these are all very strict assumptions. Subject to these strict assumptions, you can say that comparative advantage leads to free trade and free trade leads to prosperity. Ricardian theory of trade was very strongly influential through the 19th century, but in the 20th century we have a more expansive, more inclusive theory of trade which is the Heckscher Olin theory of trade. Two Swedes, Heckscher and Olin, wrote about these things simultaneously, and the Heckscher Olin theory of trade replaced Ricardian theory of trade almost completely. As I said, the Heckscher Rollin theorem, the theory of trade, which is also known as Heckscher Rollin theorem, is more, more inclusive and more expansive in the sense that it does not restrict itself to one factor of production labor. It includes both labor and capital, and in a generalized form, it can include any number of factorized products factors of production. The basic illustrations of heckscher rollin theorem happen with two factors of production, capital and labor. So, it is more expansive, more, more inclusive of a larger number of situations.
Hexaprism theorem also permits a greater variety of application of the idea of comparative advantage. It is not labor productivity differences alone. In fact, Hexaprism theorem says productivity differences across countries can change over time. But what cannot change is the endowment of factors of production. How much labor you have, how much capital you have, that endowment does not change. Whereas, you might have so much of labor and so much of capital, its productivity might change in 6 months time with technology changing. So, Hexaprism theorem emphasizes the resource endowments rather than productivity of labor as a source of advantage. So, a country which has abundance of any factor of production, say capital, will have a comparative advantage in exporting that product which uses more capital or which is capital intensive. Right? So, more generally a country will have comparative advantage in the export of that commodity which is intensive in the use of the abundant factor of production in that country. Now, you can see this is a different cup of tea altogether as compared to Ricardo, much less restrictive and in a general in a general form you can have this theorem applying with any number of factor of production. Why not just 2, why not 6, 7 as long as, long as you can put them in an analyzable form. The advent of Hexaprism theorem made international theory, even international trade theory, even more extensively analyzed, and made it much deeper in, in its capacity to interpret economic situations. By the 1960s. the belief in any idea of comparative advantage started declining in the world. It was found that trade occurred due to a number of reasons, not necessarily comparative advantage either of the Ricardo or the Heckscher Olin type. In other words, the fundamental assumption of Ricardo that there should be comparative advantage for you to trade and then with comparative advantage free trade grows across the world and brings prosperity to everybody. Hexaprism theorem was an extension of this idea whereas, there were other theories which came up alternative theories of trade which came up which questioned whether the idea of comparative advantage had any meaning at all, had any relevance at all. They brought about other explanations which explain things, which explain why trade happened without necessarily making it free trade and more efficient trade. One such idea was the product cycle theory. Now, the product cycle theory is traced back to Vernon and the theory tells you that trade happens not because a country has comparative advantage in x, y, z etcetera. Trade happens because it is a newly patented product and somebody has 
monopoly rights to manufacture that under intellectual property rights and he manufactures it, others cannot manufacture it, so he sells it to them. So, product cycle theory is a nice way of explaining how a new product comes into world market and how it expands and how it get starts getting manufactured all over the world. Now, the cycle of the product is like this. A new product is invented, a new technology is invented, an, inter an intellectual property comes into existence. The owner of that intellectual property, the company concerned or the organization concerned capitalizes on this on a monopoly basis by manufacturing and selling it first domestically, where the market is. Because it is easier to canvas something in your own market than in a foreign market and you are protected from foreigners producing it anyway because you are of your IP. So, the first phase immediately after acquisition of intellectual property rights the product starts getting manufactured domestically for domestic market and as this grows foreigners hear about this product and they want it in their country too. So, next phase in, in uh, phase 2 you start exporting this product with the export of this product you move from domestic to foreign market as a source of revenue not that you give up domestic market but more and more foreign markets are buying your product it becomes more and more exported product phase 2 phase 3 the foreign demand for this product might be might have become so high that you start thinking whether it is cheaper to keep exporting it to that country or simply cheaper to set up a plant in the other country and make it there. In other words, at this point in time you do not export the product anymore, but you export capital and technology. In order that you set up production facilities abroad in phase 3. In phase 4 your intellectual property has expired, you no longer have the patent 20 years have passed or 7 years have passed or whatever. At that time the production of this product becomes prolific because nobody is prevented from making it anymore. There is a, there is a massive spurt of this product all over the world in phase 5 what happens is this big company which set up foreign branches all over the world it finds foreign market competition too high. So, it either diversifies the foreign production into some other product or simply closes down and focuses on domestic market. This is the product cycle theory of Werner would you like to write this down. It is, isn't it? It is. It is. But what is important in the product cycle theory is that it, it doesn't talk of comparative advantage. It doesn't talk of free trade. 
it actually talks of trade under monopolistic conditions. And uh, in fact, the post Hecherolian theories of trade, there are so many of them, they are all talking of how trade comes about under different conditions and in none of these conditions do you have to have comparative advantage. The other theory of trade which became popular after Marx has started writing about it is the theory of imperialism. The theory of imperialism uh, I think it was written in 1917 or 18, Lenin wrote a little pamphlet called Imperialism, the Final Stage of Development of Capitalism. The argument here is like this, finance and capital become the source of growth in all developed countries in the west. Gradually, they also become the source of trading between the other parts of the world and these countries. And eventually, they also become the source of export of capital to these other countries to exploit their raw materials and then create semi finished products to be sent back to the parent country. So, the industrialization of developed country is funded by financial institutions from the developed countries, which set up subsidiary units in underdeveloped countries <coughs> to create semi finished or partially finished goods, which can be finished and completed in the developed countries. So, under this trade happens because of the power of capital from developed countries to exploit the resources of underdeveloped countries. The theory of imperialism is a very central part of Marxist economics. You cannot have development of any part of the world as a capitalist country without imperialism according to Marxian thinking. Would you like to write this down? Right. By 1960s, American research scholarship in development of industries, organization of industries unfolded new knowledge and that knowledge was that modern capitalist systems do not work on the basis of profit maximization motive. This came out in a classic work by Bain, a Harvard professor, I think 1960, he wrote a book called Barriers to Entry in American Industry. Now, what he wrote was that in a study of I do not recall how many industries he studied, but quite an extensive study of industries across the US. He found that maximization of profit was not the number or what even not even a top priority consideration in these industries. The principal concern of these industries were to create barriers to entry within the industry by different firms. In other words, the word is market share holding on to market share and expanding market share is the concern. 
and different strategies used in this direction become the portfolio of strategies in different firms. From this point of view then capitalism is predatory and the international version of Bain type of hypothesis is found in the writings of Krugman whose theories of state trade are based mostly on entry barrier strategies. An industry could a firm could create barriers to entry in a number of ways. The first thing is getting an IP intellectual property getting a patent. <coughs> getting a patent ensures that nobody can enter this trade for x number of years and that gives you sufficient ground to build a massive market share and make other intellectual patents which will expand the market share. The second strategy is creating a very high sunk cost type of technology. Are you familiar with the sunk cost? Tell me what it is. Well, not so much whether they are recoverable or not, but it is just that they are incurred and uh, they are recoverable in such a long time that uh, it virtually decides the fate of technology in that industry. Petrochemicals is one example, oil refining is another example, fertilizer is another power generation is another. These are all industries, these are all technology industries incorporating very high sunk cost. One advantage of having a technology with high sunk costs is that you make it virtually impossible for anybody else to be able to afford this technology. You can have only a few companies who are doing big time petroleum refinery. You can, you can have only a few companies which are into big time petrochemicals. So, the decision to adopt a technology involving high sunk costs itself is a barrier. This is the second strategy used by many corporates to create barriers. In a situation where your demand is unpredictable in the long run, and at the same time you can recover your sunk costs only over the long run. The whole economics of the viability of your industry becomes questionable if there is big competition. So, the idea is to preempt competition by simply creating very high sunk costs, a technology with very high sunk costs, so that you are virtually a monopolist. So, this is the second strategy used by many firms opting for entry barrier strategies. The third aspect of entry barrier strategies is very well known advertising. Advertising not so much in the positive sense of propagating the positive qualities of your product vis a vis the others but to create a space in the minds of the public which is your space. So, you create market shares by creating mind shares. <coughs> <coughs> Heavy advertising costs towards the end are therefore, fairly common. So, when Bain found all these things he started asking the question, how significant is the profit maximization objective of the firm? He did not know. He certainly knew that firms wanted to do a lot of other things. Second, how efficient is such an industrial structure? 
I mean your theory tells you that the motive of profit maximization gives you efficiency, but if your motivation is entry barriers your tendency to become more and more monopolistic and monopolistically competitive which means you become more and more inefficient. So, entry barrier strategies and globally practiced across global investments which then regulate global trade make global trade very inefficient. At the same time it does not matter whether the global trade is inefficient or not because for the players in the global market what is important is market share. So, this is called the industrial organization approach. The industrial organization approach to trade merely tells you that you do not you do not need to have comparative advantage, you do not need to become efficient. There are a number of other reasons why trade happens such as entry barrier. It is pointed out that one of the best examples of this kind of international economic activity was the attempt by Enron to build power generation in the west coast of India. The whole idea was to make sure that nobody else picked up that project and eventually when it became totally non-viable cost wise it was abandoned. So, a large number of investments happen across the world by gigantic corporations to ensure that there are no rivals in the trade across the world. So, this is the industrial organization approach. Finally, finally there are large number of political factors which involve countries in trade or which prevent countries from getting involved in trade. So, political economy is a very important factor. When a large number of political and economic factors have to be traded off against each other in making trade decisions, then the process is not a rational process, the process is not a rational decision making process. There are so many objectives you have in the political economic portfolio that some of these objectives might be mutually contradictory, some of these might be mutually conflicting. So, you cannot decide on any one particular objective and decide not to satisfy other objectives. So, in this decision making process in trade invariably involves a compromise, a compromise activity which is not efficient in the sense of choosing any one which is the best, but which is efficient in the sense of making sure that as many criteria are possible are satisfied. This approach is called the bounded rationality approach. Bounded rationality approach. goes back to that very great organizational psychologist Herbert Simon who was probably one of the few people to get a Nobel prize in economics through the root of psychology. So, if in the bounded rationality approach what you are saying is decision making in international relations in international trade is a very complex political economic process where you are always trading off one against the another in the among the ingredients of the decision making process and in this way you are constantly striking compromises between objectives so you end up being rational 
but in a limited or a bounded way because you are always compromising. So, this approach is called the bounded rationality approach. The idea of bounded rationality of course, as I said goes back to the work of Herbert Simon in the 1940s when he was studying the behavior of American organizations. Well, we have come to the end of this Saturday's class and uh, see you next week. Have a nice weekend.